Hi everyone, good morning. Today we are having a conversation around the topic of air quality. In particular, we're going to be discussing how air quality can impact your health and to gain some perspective on Utah's specific air quality. We're also going to be discussing what organizations can do like Intermountain to help Utah's air quality while capturing some actions we can take personally to improve the air at home, work, and our community. Today, we're joined by Bryce Bird, Director with the Utah Department of Environmental Qualities Division of Air Quality, and Dr. Liz Joy, Senior Medical Director of Wellness and Nutrition, Board Chair of UCARE, and Co-Chair of the Air Quality and Health Team here at Intermountain Healthcare. Thank you both so much for joining us. It's nice to have you on. Thank you very much. Thank Happy you. to be here. So Bryce, I'm gonna start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit um, about the uh, combination between you and Liz Joy working together um, on your role here, uh, kind of in what you do specifically with the Utah Department of Environmental Quality Division of Health. So, so we are the regulatory agency that is responsible for uh, both uh, addressing air quality standards in the state and of course, uh, permitting sources of air pollution um, and controlling those. We have inspectors that go out there and verify compliance. Uh, we, we conduct the air monitoring that uh, provides the regulatory basis for our air quality programs and uh, various activities in coordinating with policymakers and lawmakers in developing rules and legislation around air quality. Uh, that work is, is very uh, intensive. We have a very good relationship with the regulated community. So the industries that we regulate, for instance, um, but uh, I, I think where we have teamed up with, with UCARE and with IHC is the fact that uh, we're learning that as we have controlled much of our air pollution, what's left is uh, attributable to our individual activities. And so what uh, we, we use partnerships for is to help individuals understand their, their individual contribution to, to air pollution and what they can do to protect themselves from uh, adverse impacts from air pollution. And that's where this partnership is really effective. And we'll kind of get into more specifics around that in just a moment. But Dr. Joy, let's begin with outlining the role clear, clean air plays in supporting our overall health. How important is clean air to our health? Well, you know, I really think most of us take clean air for granted. You know, we expect the air to be clean. And uh, I'm not a Utah native, I come from Minnesota. You know, and if we ever had bad air in Minnesota, you know, the wind would just take it over to Wisconsin. Um, I never really gave air quality a thought until I moved to Utah and my very first winter here skiing up at Alta in Little Cottonwood Canyon and all of a sudden coming down the canyon at the end of the day, seeing this cloud of gray air in the valley. And I, I had to ask my husband, what is that? You know, to which he said, well, that's an inversion. And that's really where I started to become real interested in air quality and health. I'm a very big proponent of physical activity and particularly outdoor physical activity. And we live in such a phenomenal place, you know, to take advantage of the outdoor. I mean, frankly, it's just too cold in Minnesota to be exercising outdoors. I think it's about minus 15 there this morning. Um, so here we have this great environment and um, yet when we have uh, bad air, we have air pollution, we have you know, uh, temperature inversions that trap pollution in our breathing atmosphere, um, you know, it really does in inhibit that. So you know, clean air is important. It's oftentimes taken for granted. We are fortunate that, you know, and I think Bryce would agree with this, our air is actually really good most of the time. One of the things that is unique about Utah is we have these spikes of bad air. So our air is good most of the time, we take it for granted, we wanna have lower spikes of that um, poor air. I also did not grow up in Utah and I remember when I moved here, I kind of felt the same way. You do feel like you're in this bubble when you're up in the Cottonwood Canyons that you kind of look below and you're confused as to how it's so clear uh, up at the resorts. And then there's, like you said, this kind of gray haze. So it definitely took me a while to learn what the inversion was and kind of how it affected us. And speaking of those effects too, Dr. Joy, what are some of the potential adverse health effects for us um, when the air quality is really poor? That's a great question. And um, the effects are a multitude. We tend to take what we refer to as a systems approach, you know, to the impact of air pollution on health. And by systems, I mean, you know, your respiratory system, 
um, so your lungs, um, your cardiac system, so your heart, um, and, uh, and, and other effects as well. So for example, we're, we're learning that, you know, air pollution may be a risk factor for cognitive decline, you know, as people are aging, uh, because air pollution is very inflammatory and it's inflammatory changes, whether it's happening in the lungs or, or excuse me, in the brain or in the lungs or in the heart, you know, that actually cause problems. So in the lungs, I think that's what people think of first and foremost, you know, that air pollution is going to either cause or exacerbate um, asthma, you know, um, in infants, children, and adults. Um, and uh, that air pollution, um, you know, can uh, impact the heart. And there's been research done at Intermountain Healthcare um, that shows a relationship between poor air and um, risk of heart, heart attack. Um, likewise, uh, in the brain, we see a relationship between um, air pollution and a higher risk of stroke. What you're seeing on the slide right here, you know, is a graphic that we um, developed looking at the relationship between air pollution and the risk of um, in infections, respiratory infections, that can in turn result in the need to go to an urgent care or an emergency room or a hospitalization. And what it's showing is that um, PM 2.5, which is um, small particle pollution, um, that it can um, increase uh, susceptibility um, to uh, infection um, by uh, respiratory pathogens. So, so this is starting to get into that relationship you know, right now between air pollution and COVID-19, um, you know, as a respiratory virus. And there have been some studies showing that, you know, when air pollution is poor, that people are having more severe um, effects from the COVID-19 infection. And that's been um, observed and reported and published from some folks in, um, uh, in England, in the UK. So when air pollution is bad, um, we also have a greater risk of exposure because people tend to spend more time inside, right? We're, we're telling them, wow, air quality is poor, don't spend too much time outside. So they spend more time inside, you know, with other people, you know, and potentially they may have an increased exposure to respiratory pathogens. And then air pollution, as I mentioned, causes inflammation in the airways. And that means when you are exposed to a um, virus, you know, we're exposed all the time, right? But we don't always get infected. Um, but now we're thinking, you know, when we postulate that um, uh, air pollution exposure can actually increase the likelihood when you are exposed to a virus that you actually become infected with that virus. And then lastly, again, that combination now of inflammation in the airways from air pollution combined with you know, the effects of a viral or a bacterial infection together make for more serious illness. And that's where we see an increase in healthcare utilization. And, you know, um, both children and adults requiring more frequent visits to the emergency department or uh, the need for hospitalization. And maybe the last thing I'll mention is, is that we think about air quality is affecting people who already have underlying illness. But air quality also affects healthy people. And one of the areas, you know, that has really come under scrutiny um, in the recent um, years is the relationship between air quality and pregnancy. And our colleagues at the University of Utah have published a number of studies showing that um, air quality can adversely affect pregnancy outcomes and specifically um, higher rates of miscarriage and others have demonstrated a, a higher risk of premature delivery. So air quality not only affects people who have underlying disease, whether it's heart disease or stroke or dementia, but it also can affect healthy people. That's really interesting. I feel like you don't normally think of kind of those, the, the pregnancy effects or anything like that. You typically think if I'm going to go for a run and the air quality is low, it's probably going to affect the abilities that I have. So I think you bring up a great point that it's not just these known causes that air quality could potentially affect, but there's other things that we look at from a healthcare system. So thank you for that really great insight. Bryce, I wanna switch over to you. I understand that the Utah Division of Air Quality recently released its annual report 
Uh, we'll share that link out to viewers so they can look at it in full, but what are some promising findings in the publication that people can expect when they look at it? Really, uh, we have a success story. Um, if we look at our air quality trends over time, especially for fine particulate matter, uh, we are seeing that uh, air quality has uh, improved over the past uh, 30, 40, and 50 years. Uh, each year we're, we're getting better. Um, when we look at, uh, in particular, this past year, we have some interesting uh, data that we can analyze, and that is the, the fact that we had exceptional air quality. And uh, we, we've been asked the question and uh, looked at it very carefully, you know, why, why was this year so good? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the sources of air pollution are diverse. We have industrial sources, we have natural sources of air pollution, things like wildfires. Uh, we have, um, of course, vehicles and the activities that we have, our homes and businesses that uh, contribute to air quality. Really the big change in 2000, uh, or sorry, 2020, was the fact that uh, many people were not driving as much. And so this graphic looks at the cumulative number of days where air quality was above an air quality index of 100. Uh, so this is the level that uh, EPA has determined is unhealthy for sensitive groups. Um, and so this is really what we're focusing on when we're trying to develop our plans to make sure that we, we provide air that is below this standard at all times. Uh, what we saw in, in this graphic is you can see the, the historical range uh, over the past 20 years of uh, the minimum and maximum number of days uh, cumulative throughout the year of days where the air quality index was above 100. Uh, in 2020, we saw that we didn't have our first day above uh, that air quality index of 100 or orange air quality if you're familiar with the, the color index uh, until the 4th of July. Uh, and this was the, the longest stretch of healthy air <laughs> that we'd ever seen uh, along the Wasatch Front. Uh, so you can see that the minimum maximum is there in the shaded area. The, the gray bar represents the five-year average. And then the, 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 the dark orange represents what we saw in, in 2020. And really quick. Oh, sorry. I just have a quick question. You mentioned that we didn't reach that until July of last year. Um, and you might get to this, but what do we normally reach that on healthy air quality day? Is it typically earlier or is, it, is July pretty normal? Uh, so if you can see the kind of where the, the, the white area uh, appears at the bottom uh, of the graphic. So usually by January, we've exceeded that standard. So, so we, we've exceeded that level typically by January. Um, actually, never before or after January is, I guess, what the, the graphic shows. Um, and, and, you know, typically January, February, March, we, we have exceeded up to 20 or, or even 30 times that, that, that level. Uh, and in, in again, this year, we, we had good air quality all the way through the summer. And then when we started to see some elevated ozone levels and then wildfire impacts is when we start, started to see the, the stair stepping up. But we still ended up uh, uh, over on the, the far right side, um, almost the cleanest year ever, despite the fact that we had a, a very strong wildfire season. So lots of smoke impacts. And we had one of the hottest summers, actually it was the hottest July and August ever. Uh, in the Wasatch Front. And so that's typically when we see the summertime ozone formation is when we have clear skies and temperatures above 95 degrees. And so we would have expected to be up there in that 20 or 30 days um, exceeding the standards or, or exceeding that level where uh, last year was, was much better. If you go to the next graphic, one of the things that, that we can look at is the fact that vehicle miles traveled on our roads was, was down. You can see the, the large dip in the March timeframe, but even throughout the summer and into the winter, we saw about a 15% reduction in vehicle miles traveled. And so it really does show that since vehicles are the primary component of both our, our winter air pollution and our summer air pollution, uh, that reducing vehicle miles traveled is a great lesson that we can take into the future of how to solve our air quality challenges in, along the Wasatch Front. That's really interesting. And it kind of, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you think about the fact that people are not going to be traveling as much. They're working from home a little bit more. Um, so the graph you just showed us makes perfect sense to me, but it's interesting and it'll be interesting to see what happens as we kind of move back into um, working from the office more, if that changes the air quality factor. And I'm sure you guys are tracking to see kind of what happens for that as well, right? We are and actually making plans to, to capture really the success stories. 
uh, and see how we can apply them and, and share the, the, the good news of, about what is possible, but also uh, take the lessons we've learned from this pandemic situation and say, well, when we have meteorology in place where we could have air pollution buildup, can we take these steps at that point as well and, and receive some of the health benefits that Dr. Joy mentioned earlier? And what are some of the concerns that you and your colleagues have about the future of our air quality? Really, our biggest challenge is growth. Uh, the reason we have air pollution challenges is because we live in a bowl. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, many other areas don't have the challenges that we have. And in fact, our per capita emissions are lower than most other metropolitan areas because of the plans and some of the restrictions that we have in place. Uh, and so the fact is we have meteorology and topography which lead to our concentrations of air pollution both in the summer and the winter time. And uh, because of uh, that same topography, we, we can't build it out in the mountains or out into the West Desert uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, we're adding all of our growth to the areas where we already have air pollution challenges. And so our biggest uh, concern for the future is the fact that the Wasatch Front is gonna double in population in the next 30 years. And how do we accommodate that growth? And uh, especially uh, not only keep things from getting worse, but even improve from where we are today. That's our biggest challenge. And I wanna talk about what are some of the sources of the air quality pollution. When I think of them, I think of the refineries that are kind of located in Northern Salt Lake. And I don't know if that's necessarily true that that contributes to the poor air quality, but what are some actual sources of that pollution? Well, I think the smokestack industries are, are an easy target and they have been. That was really the focus of our efforts in the 70s, 80s and 90s to uh, control air pollution. And we've seen those industries reduce their emissions by about 75% during that time. Uh, and so right now, the refineries in the Wasatch Front as, as a combination of all five refineries represent about 3% of our pollution that's responsible for our, our winter particulate and summer ozone pollution. So uh, they're a very small component. When you look at all industry, uh, so all smokestack industries, we're looking at about 13% is the total. And so then you start looking, well, who's responsible for the rest? And it's, it's us. Uh, so almost 50% of the emissions come from vehicles. And that would be both the delivery of goods and services from the heavy diesel vehicles and then our consumer activities and, and just how we move around. Uh, I was shocked when I heard this for the first time, but, but in Salt Lake County, we drive about 30 million miles a day. And so each of us contribute a little bit to that, but when you look at the, the combination, that's, that's a lot of vehicles traveling, that's a lot of gasoline being burned, and of course the associated emissions. Uh, some of the good news when we look at vehicles is the fact that uh, newer vehicles are much cleaner than older vehicles. So uh, EPA set new vehicle emission standards that started in 2017 and will be fully imp implemented by 2025 which would, uh, resulted in an 80% reduction between what we term a tier three vehicle and the older tier two vehicles. And so as the fleet turns over, uh, we know that the vehicles are gonna be 80% cleaner than they, they were before. Um, but again, our biggest challenge is uh, the sprawl, that, that still our vehicle miles traveled is growing at twice the rate of population because people tend to live further and further away from where they work as the, the area grows. And so, uh, and then the other, component is what we term area sources. And this is just activities that are associated with population centers. This is our restaurants. This is uh, our, our homes. So when we heat our home, we have a water heater and a furnace, furnace that operate. Uh, those uh, emit air pollution when we cook our food. And especially if we uh, have a wood-fired pizza or a, 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 a fire-grilled burger, uh, you may be seeing the smoke that comes from those. Uh, and again, each restaurant is very small, but when you service 2 million people, that, that, that uh, combination of emissions is really our, our biggest challenge. And they are all tied to directly and associated with population. And so that, that's our, our biggest challenge. And, and that's really the focus of our efforts to help people understand their contribution and to uh, find control strategies that can help us uh, mitigate those impacts as the population grows. So it sounds like a lot of this has to do with individuals, organizations, um, and those people can all potentially make an impact on our air quality. How can policymakers specifically help support clean air? Really, as, as I mentioned, uh, some of the lessons learned from teleworking is, is that we can be productive uh, with many jobs um, by, by utilizing technology that we have available today. So 
uh, our agency is one that uh, even before the COVID pandemic started, uh, had been looking at teleworking as an option to reduce vehicle miles traveled and our, our impact on, on the environment. And uh, so we adopted technology, uh, things like virtual meetings, uh, being able to have uh, cell phones for our employees that they can be accessed uh, easily. And of course, uh, the data tools so we can share documents and things like that. And what we found is we're actually have been more productive uh, working remotely than we had been in the office. And so we track things like our permitting timelines. So uh, we have a group of engineers that reviews uh, sources of air pollution. And our, actually our permitting timelines have come down from where they were pre-pandemic to where they were post, even though we've been working 100% out of the office during this time. And so these are the, the things that we're trying to capture and working with uh, Intermountain Healthcare, with UCARE, with the Salt Lake Chamber, with the University of Utah to try to, again, capture some, some good practices that we can use and then be able to implement those in the future, especially in response to, again, uh, meteorological, meteor, sorry, meteorological conditions where we have the potential to have higher pollution levels. It sounds like it's a really big team effort. And Dr. Joy, this question is for you. Is Intermountain aware of the need to improve air quality? And what steps are we particularly taking to improve the air quality from an organizational perspective? That's a great question. You know, Intermountain is the state's largest private employer. And we certainly realize that, you know, um, as part of our community stewardship, you know, that we have to um, play a meaningful role in, you know, protecting the health of our community members that we serve. And so Intermountain launched its air quality and health team, you know, eight or nine years ago. And we've, you know, been working as a multidisciplinary team, you know, to develop um, tools, you know, for physicians, um, other healthcare providers, and for our patients, you know, to uh, better understand how to address the impact of air quality on health as part of patient care. And for people, patients, the community to be empowered, you know, with information, I mean, you know, that information is power, you know, so that they can make good choices, you know, when it comes to exposure to air pollution for themselves um, and their loved ones. So we've done a lot of work in that space and, um, and it's available on uh, intermountainhealthcare.org backslash clean air. So people can access those resources there and they may find them very, very helpful when it comes to, you know, how do I protect my child or my parent um, who may have, you know, a condition that puts them at greater risk for the adverse effects of air quality. So that's kind of on the health side of things. Um, on the sustainability side, um, um, previously I worked with um, Steve Bergstrom, who's certainly well known to Bryce. He's been an air quality champion, a sustainability champion you know, in um, Utah for a long time. And now with Glenn Garrick, who has moved into that role. And Intermountain does all sorts of stuff, you know, that is around um, trying to make the air cleaner. We are using clean energy, you know, and um, trying to, to get more and more of our um, energy to run all of our facilities, healthcare facilities from solar. Um, we are transitioning our fleet of vehicles. Bryce talked about how you know, the, when we talk about tailpipe emissions, it's not just our personal vehicles that we drive, you know, but it's also the fleet vehicles and delivery trucks. And so, you know, we're transitioning our fleet over to um, hybrid and electric, you know, in an effort to try and, and reduce tailpipe emissions. We are installing electric vehicle chargers, you know, at our facilities, both for Intermountain caregivers, as well as for patients who are visiting those facilities. And uh, we've been gradually expanding that over time. Um, and we are also, um, you know, just working to uh, inform our caregivers, you know, about how they can make individual choices that improve the air. And certainly um, telework, you know, that accelerated significantly um, as the pandemic um, has evolved, um, will now influence our telework policy going forward. And I think uh, Intermountain has had nearly a third of its workforce, you know, working from home um, as a result of the uh, pandemic. And um, we're looking at uh, continuing with a robust telework policy, but also, you know, having uh, policy uh, that is in that it that specifically addresses um, air quality. And so, as the air quality starts to um, decline. 
you know, we will encourage more and more people to work from home. And again, take those cars off the road since tailpipe emissions play um, such a significant, um, um, a significant role. And maybe one more thing while I'm thinking about it is um, another strategy that we're doing again with our fleet is monitoring idle time. So, you know, it's not just, you know, I mean, the cars don't drive themselves uh, for the most part. Um, and so we have uh, monitors um, on our fleet vehicles that tell us how much the, that vehicle is idling. And so then we can provide some direct education to our drivers to decrease idle time. And that in turn, again, reduces um, tailpipe emissions. So we're doing lots in this space to try and improve air quality. And as far as community members, what types of actions can I take and, and where can I get resources outside of just our Intermountain website to figure out if there's a volunteer uh, project I can join or something along those lines if I'm really passionate about air quality? Well, I think Bryce and I can both answer that question, but I'll, I'll give it a start. Um, you know, uh, I serve as the chair of UCARE, the Utah Clean Air Partnership. You know, and, and our primary role is really around educating the public about, you know, what they can do um, at an individual level. Um, but again, also working with larger partners, but at an individual level, what can they do, you know, in order to uh, improve air quality? And um, let's start with, you know, what you can do in your car. And, um, you know, that is, you know, trying to not drive when air quality is worsening, you know, and you can look at a three day forecast on some of the air quality apps and, and maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, it's other driving strategies like chain tripping so that you're not going from your house to the grocery store and home, house to school and home, you know, house to the dry cleaner and home that you try and chain trip together so that your car is not doing cold starts. When you're doing cold starts, that increases, you know, your tailpipe emissions. Um, if you have the opportunity to carpool to work, you know, that's another strategy. Maybe it takes two or three cars off the road. Um, and public transportation. And that's been a little tricky with the pandemic. You know, people have been avoiding public transportation because they don't want that close proximity, you know, with other people on a bus or on a train. But, but typically public transportation is another strategy that people can take. And then, you know, when you are replacing a vehicle um, and you're thinking, okay, it's time for, time for a new car for me. You know, Bryce talked about how, you know, the newer um, uh, uh, gas burning uh, vehicles um, are burning much cleaner, you know, than older vehicles, but maybe consider hybrid or electric. We're seeing the price of those vehicles decline to the same uh, or similar level of some of our traditional gas burning cars. So those are things you can do, you know, around transportation, but there are things you can do at home as well. And, you know, again, uh, as you mentioned, Amanda, you think about those smokestacks, you know, in the northwest corner of Salt Lake as being, you know, such big polluters. Um, but um, it's our individual behaviors like the gas powered um, lawnmower that we use, you know, or the weed whacker, you know, or our snowmobile. You know, those are also sources of pollution. So, you know, finding clean energy alternatives um, or no energy alternatives. Um, so, you know, for years, um, you know, my lawn was small enough that I could use a push mower. And um, the only energy that was expended was my own personal energy, um, which was great. I got a little exercise and there was no particulate pollution, you know, while I was mowing my lawn. Um, but, uh, and now, uh, you know, in, in an effort to save water, which is like a whole nother conversation around sustainability, we actually ripped up all of our grass and zero scaped our yard, you know, as a strategy, you know, to, you know, be kinder, you know, to the environment in which we live. Um, it's, you know, having a low, uh, what we call low NOx water heaters. Bryce talked about water heaters as being part of that area source pollution. So. Um, you know, we try to partner with builders, um, or if you're replacing a water heater, you know, uh, try and find one that is um, less um, polluting. So all sorts of things that we can do at an individual level that, you know, in total can really have a meaningful impact on air quality. Bryce, I want to turn some time over to you. Uh, Dr. Joy mentioned a couple of different places where we can check the air quality and kind of find out more information for ourselves. 
what are these sources for people who are watching? How can I go on the internet or my phone and actually figure out what the air quality is like today? So we have a, a number of resources. Again, as the regulatory agency, we're responsible for uh, showing compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And so we maintain a, a monitoring network and we provide a three-day forecast on our website at uh, air.utah.gov or on the Utah Air app. And this forecast uh, really serves two purposes. One is a, a, a call to action. And so if we have good air quality and we anticipate that it's going to stay that way because of the, the meteorology that we're experiencing the, over the next few days, uh, then we would have uh, no calls to action, so unrestricted action. And then there's a, the health message that's tied to the air quality index. Now, uh, people are maybe not as familiar with the air quality index. It's a, a color-coded index that was developed by the Environmental Protection Agency. And it's also related to the school flag program. And basically it goes from green to brown <laughs> uh, through a, a spectrum of colors. Uh, and uh, really just tells you um, what you should do to protect yourself. And so when we have good air quality, you know, go out and exercise outside, um, certainly take advantage of that. Uh, when we hit yellow air quality, that's when we start to see maybe some impacts and we should maybe consider moving our exercise to either higher elevation in the, the winter time and get out of the inversion or, or move that activity indoors. Once we had orange air quality, that's where we're unhealthy for sensitive groups and we would expect people to be impacted even not exercising at that point uh, that have a lung condition, asthma, something like that. Um, once we get to, to red air quality, that's when it's unhealthy for everyone and really we should avoid any exertion outside uh, during that time. Um, if you go to the, the, the next slide there, um, it really just shows that. So there, there's two purposes of the forecast. One is the, the call to action, going from unrestricted action, voluntary action, or mandatory action. And when we hit mandatory action, that's when we would expect uh, large, large employers to implement a trip reduction program, for instance. That's what we're doing as a state and uh, hopefully leading out in that effort. But uh, that's when we restrict wood burning. That's when we uh, ask people to maybe do things like avoiding drive-throughs and idling uh, at drive-throughs. Um, maybe even uh, encouraging uh, you know, other options to make sure we're not taking the, that, that lunch trip during the day. So the, the cold start, as was mentioned, maybe bring your lunch that day. All these things are small things that, that we can do that, that really, um, are, when, when they're combined amongst our entire population can make a big difference. And again, the, the levels of the air quality index and the color coding are, are mentioned there as well. I think that the fact that as someone, a consumer, can look up this information and kind of figure out for myself um, if what I'm doing is going to be impacting their quality, I think that's super important. Um, Bryce or Dr. Joy, is there anything else that you'd like to mention to us today just before we wrap up around air quality? Bryce, I'll start with you and then Liz, I'll have you go. Just to reinforce what's already been said, uh, we, we have great resources that are available. So all of the the, the tools that Dr. Joy mentioned about what we can do as individuals, those are available on the UCARE website. Uh, and so you can go through each one of those and say, well, what can I do today? Uh, and everyone doesn't have to do everything, but everyone can do something to improve air quality. As far as uh, information about what you can do for policy when, with regard to air quality, of course, our legislature is in session right now and they determine the policy for the state uh, on a number of issues. And so they would probably appreciate hearing from their constituents that uh, air quality is a concern for them and ask you know, what they can do to, to, to help. There are 22 bills that relate to air quality that are before the legislature uh, right now. And if uh, you want to get a hold of your legis legis legislator, uh, you can do that at le.utah.gov. And from there, there's a, a, a link that you can find your legislator based on your address. And so uh, th that's one of the most important things is to, to um, know what you can do to be active. Uh, with the UCARE organization, there's also a partner meeting. So a monthly meeting where uh, people who are interested in air quality issues get together and there's a partner list on UCARE's website. So you can see if there's a, a, an issue that is important to you, whether it's clean vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, solar, uh, a number of other issues. There are partners that really focus on those issues and that's a great resource to be able to understand who's working in that area and what you can do to, to join in and uh, assist in our efforts to, to get the, the public educated and make those choices that improve air quality. And Dr. Joy? Well, I'll add to um, Bryce's comments about um, 
you know, being involved in uh, the development of the policy, you know, that really makes for a healthier um, community. And uh, not only can you reach out to um, your legislator, but you can be involved in the Clean Air Caucus. And um, this is a group of legislators who um, are very well informed about how air quality policy can really make a significant difference um, in our environment. And um, they meet on a monthly basis, um, although not when the legislature is in session. So um, you can learn more about the um, Air Quality Caucus and you can um, typically join through um, Facebook um, to the Air Quality Caucus meetings, which gives you an opportunity to become even more informed you know, about what um, the state is doing to really address air quality. I guess the other thing I would add in closing is just to um, really reinforce the need to be informed, that we all need to have that personal responsibility. And so, you know, on, on my cell phone, I have downloaded, you know, all of the apps, um, airnow.gov and Utah Air, and um, I look at it probably every day and, you know, to see where the air quality is. And um, that really does inform the choices I make for myself and for my family and for my patients, you know, when I'm seeing somebody in the office. So um, be informed and, and take action. Well, thank you both for joining us. I really appreciate this conversation. And we will put some resources into the comments of the Facebook Live after we're done. If you'd like to go to an Intermountain resource, though, that uh, URL again for you is intermountainhealthcare.org backslash clean air. Liz, Bryce, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.